You are listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 417. And in this one, I chat with Jesse Birnbaum and Sandy Robinson who have kindly agreed to share their OCD stories with us. And in particular, we talk about living with OCD and chronic illnesses, going through therapy, setting up their special interest group around OCD and chronic illnesses, their experience of support groups, words of hope, and much, much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you so much to Jesse and Sandy for their time. It was great to hear their stories and see the work that they're doing. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here is Jesse and Sandy. Welcome to the podcast, Jesse and Sandy. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Brilliant. It's great to have you both on. Um, so as you know, um, I'd love to hear your, your OCD stories. Um, and obviously there's two of you on, so share, as, share what you want. And maybe also just share why there's two of you on, like the connection between you both. Go ahead, Jesse. All right. Um, so my name is Jesse, um, and I have had OCD for pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, but of course, you know, with the statistics and everything, I am one of those that took a really long time to get diagnosed. Um, I started showing symptoms when I was really, really young. Um, one of the funny stories now, looking back on it, that wasn't so funny at the time was one of my biggest OCD fears was intruders coming into the house. So I would check the alarm and under all the beds and the doors and everything. And then I was like so excited when I lost my first tooth. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get money from the tooth fairy. And then I was like, oh no, she's going to trip off the alarm. And that's going to like set my OCD, which I didn't know was OCD, but I was like, oh no, like, Um, And I ended up, I couldn't write at the time, I don't think. So I had my older brother write a note to the tooth fairy saying, please still leave the money, but don't come at night. (laughs) Because I I really didn't want the alarm to go off because it was such a fear of mine. So started pretty young um, and then went to a bunch of different therapists around middle school age. Um, So probably around like, now I'm so out of the loop, but like 11 or 12, maybe. Mm. Um, and then ended up finding an OCD therapist around the fourth go around and was diagnosed. Um, have been working with that same therapist since actually, who's been amazing. Um, and then the relation between me and Sandy, this is kind of fun. Um, I didn't know anyone with OCD, even though I had, you know, grown up with it my whole life and have been in treatment for a really long time now. Um, I'm 24 now and have been in treatment since I was like 14. So um, been a while, but I actually didn't know anyone with OCD, had not talked about OCD at all until my therapist had said, you know, I think you should find an online support group. I think it'd be really good for you to meet others. And I was like, no way. Like that does not sound good to me. Um, And then eventually I was like, okay, you're probably right. Um, And I joined this online support group that was pretty amazing. Met some great people and Sandy, (laughs) I'm kidding. Uh, Met some great people. And then through that journey also ended up starting getting really physically sick um, in college um, and uh, took many years as well to get diagnosed. And I'm still kind of in the diagnostic process, um, but have been diagnosed with a couple chronic illnesses and a rare disease. And Sandy had mentioned in one of these online groups, and I guess we had exchanged numbers Um, that she had a chronic illness and 
when I realized that I was going through all this stuff and that the OCD support groups have been so incredible, I reached out to her and asked, do you know of any chronic illness groups? Because, you know, this has been so amazing. And we didn't know of any. Um, and we were both kind of like, huh, like that kind of stinks. Um, and there definitely weren't any that had this overlap that we were both experiencing of OCD and chronic illness. So we kind of joined forces to start a group, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But um, that's how we met. And that's a bit of my story. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm Sandy and I'm from Canada and I was born pretty prematurely. And so I was born with a, a disability and also a chronic bowel condition that was pretty serious. Um, but then I also started displaying signs of what I now know is OCD, like very young, like as a toddler. But Long story short, I wasn't actually diagnosed with OCD till I was about 25. It took quite a while to get there. And then at 25, I actually went to residential in the States and I did ERP and learned all about ERP. It was quite the experience going from not knowing anything about OCD to learning I had OCD and then going to residential and sort of doing that intensive therapy like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, yeah, but I think like for me, the chronic illness and the disability, like I knew I had that my whole life, but then I not knowing I didn't, I didn't know I had OCD until I was mid twenties. Right. So I always felt like, oh, I know I'm anxious, but I don't know why I'm anxious. And so that OCD diagnosis was really a missing piece for me. And I think like, you know, it's really helped to have that, that, like label that diagnostic label for me, even if I don't like always meet the the criteria now for OCD, like from a severity standard, just knowing like, okay, your brain works a little differently and you have other tools to, to stay healthy. And I think that's really important. And as Jesse said, like, you know, we, we had sort of seen the work of the IOCDF uh, and we thought like they do such great work for OCD awareness and advocacy, especially in, you know, in the States and Canada. Um, and I mean, internationally, obviously, and then, but we didn't see anything like to do with the the overlap with OCD and chronic illness or disability. And so, you know, we sort of talked about it and we said like, you know, we'd really like to start something where people could find, um, you know, community, but also raise awareness for the intersections of these conditions. So we sort of started it, I think early 2023 and yeah, it's just been going from there. Amazing. Amazing. And um, I definitely want to ask you guys more uh, about that in a bit. Um, but on your stories for a second. Uh, so, Sandy, w um, what sort of themes of OCD did you experience growing up or how, how did it affect you? Yeah, that's uh, a really great question, because I mean, the earliest theme I remember is definitely perfectionism. I, I sort of have this this early, early memory when I was learning my like ABCs and like like numbers uh, and I was doing these flashcards. And whenever I get one wrong, I think to myself, like, I can't believe you got that wrong. Like, that's horrible. Like, you should know all this by now. And I was what, like three or four and like it was so intense. And I just I, I didn't have the understanding to understand like that. A lot of kids might just make a mistake and then sort of move on with their day. But for me, it was like a big thing. And then also a lot of social anxiety. So I would worry about like what I was saying to people and do people like me and did I say the right thing? And it was a lot of just big feelings for someone who didn't have the the ability to understand what was going on and that it was OCD. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, and then um, Jesse, uh, I guess treatment wise, what what was that like for you going through therapy and and anything you want to share on that? Yeah, I mean, it was I was pretty young, and it's I've thought about it, and I I don't remember a lot of like <laughs> the first three therapists that I met with. Um, I remember like the first one. My older brother has autism, and my parents had no idea what was going on with me, so they brought me to his like behavioral coach and. We were doing like stuff that had nothing to do with ERP or even CBT. Like I, I remember we were like playing a game and it, it really was not, you know, what would have been helpful at the time. Um, and I remember kind of flip flopping and transitioning from person to person until one of the therapists 
had, I guess, mentioned OCD to my parents um, because I don't remember ever getting the label, which, as Sandy had said, like, I think would have really been helpful and put a name to everything I was going through. Um, but then I, I'm from Los Angeles and I went to see someone at the OCD Center of Los Angeles. So they must have given someone the label because I don't think we would have found that on our own. Um, but I do remember the therapist before the one I currently see. I remember feeling really like reassured during the session. And I yeah. felt like really great for like 10 minutes after. And then by the time we got home, I didn't feel so great. Um, but I remember telling my mom, like, this is working. Like, I feel great when I'm with her. Um, and I think my mom was just so relieved at that point that, like, something was working. Um, mm-hmm. That I, I saw her for, like, over two years, I think, which is sad looking back on that, you know, it was the wrong treatment. Okay. Yeah. And then with your your, your current therapist, what sort of clicked there, do you think? I think we are pretty similar um and then also i she was actually it's funny because she was like newer at the time um which i didn't know because i was like this kid um and i think what clicked is that she really knew erp and like was very familiar with ocd and kind of got what i was going through pretty immediately um and since she knew it i it was not only that like like it was good reassurance in the sense of like I know what I'm doing and like I can actually help you and it was very concrete like I remember physically writing out the hierarchy and like coming in with like pages of pages of like I lock this door and then I lock that door and that you know like naming every door in the house and I was like she's gonna be so overwhelmed with this and then I walked in and she was like oh this is it And I was like embarrassed. I was like, no, my OCD is better than this. You're right. Like I should have more pages. Um, But I think just like the psychoeducation and the like Mm -hmm. acknowledgement of like professionality of like she really knew what she was doing. Yeah, good point. Yeah, someone who just gets it right and um, and knows the treatment well. Uh, Nice. Uh, And um, yeah. Yes, Sandy, kind of similar question for you, uh, just because you went inpatient, right? Um, and just, I guess, what was that like, you know, that going inpatient and and just doing ERP in that setting? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think it was hard at first and I don't really remember this because I was at the time really, really sick. And so I, I don't have the best memories of that time uh, just because my I don't, I just, uh, there's a lot of blanks there. Uh, but I remember my parents telling me that, like, I would call them and say, like, I need to come home. Like, this is not working and this is this is just bad and it's not good. But then, like, a few weeks into my stay, I started to sound, like, better on the phone. I started to sound, like, more myself. And I think one of the big things uh, that I learned in the, in the inpatient, the residential setting was behavioral activation to go along with ERP because I... I think I was really depressed when I was um, really sick with OCD, especially like when I didn't know what was going on. And I just like my world kept getting smaller and smaller. And that those behavioral behavioral activation skills and really like acting the way you want to feel and just trying to like slowly reclaim my life from OCD was really, really important. And I think like for me, behavioral activation is really important still to this day because like I think if I you know if I didn't uh sort of act in a values-based way my life could get smaller if I got stressed or you know had something not great happen in my life but I think like behavioral activation and ERP are just like such important skills for me still yeah yeah really good really good point yeah and I think it's looking for ways to tie in exposure that behaviorally activates people as well you know um yes yeah Yeah, I like that so okay so to both of you now how so I had Duke on recently um Duke has type 1 diabetes and OCD uh, and he shared how his OCD actually plays into the diabetes um where he has to like uh, with his insulin change the numbers a certain amount of time on his insulin pen and obviously that can yeah. So, so I'm just curious for you guys whether OCD plays into any of your chronic illnesses. 
Oh yeah, big time. And I that's that's the big reason we started our special interest group is because we noticed how much the two interact with each other. Um, and I I guess I, I stated things wrong a little wrong earlier in the sense that I did find one support group online that was for chronic illness and it was in my state at the time I was in North Carolina. It was me and two women who were about like 95 years old. And like there were, we were living very different experiences going through our chronic illnesses. Um, and a lot of what I realized I was saying was related to my OCD when I would bring up the chronic illness and they would talk and they're like, yeah, I talked back to my doctor and I told him that that was a horrible plan. And I was like, oh my God, my OCD could never, like there was so much. I realized that Hmm. my OCD was like latching on to this chronic illness. Um, For me, I know Sandy and I have talked about some similarities we have in this sense, but there's a lot of perfectionism that shows up with like, wanting to be like the perfect patient. Like I know it's different in all of the um, like internationally, but here we have my chart or like some sort of like portal that you can message your doctors. Hmm. And I didn't want to message them too much or bother them or like, you know, if I wanted them to think I was like a really good patient and I was taking the medications and I was following through and Unfortunately, I've had some really bad experiences with the medical system and I didn't really stand up for myself because I wanted to be that perfect patient and like really wanted them to see that I was trying and like I care about this too. Um, There's so many other overlaps. I mean, another big one for me has been, I know Sandy and I differ here in that my journey has been really like cloudy and confusing because my diagnosis is not has not been as clear. I was misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease um, and have kind of gone through a bunch of testing to see what the illness is. Um, And for me, a lot of it has been like the doctors think you're making this up because you don't have something as clear cut as diabetes or as Crohn's or something like that. Um, And then I get really in my head about like, what do the doctors think about this? And um, I'll make sure that they like, really like agree with what I'm saying, or, you know, it just gets very heady and very mental compulsion-y to use clinical terms. But um, yeah, there's, there's so many overlaps. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. I think I really want to echo Jesse in the perfectionism piece. I know like being that perfect patient and like following the instructions and the protocols down to the letter is such a big thing for me. And also like in the advocacy of chronic illness, like like phoning up the doctor and saying, oh, it's been a month. You know, why haven't I heard anything about X test? Like that's really hard because I mean, it's hard for anybody because it takes energy and spoons. But I, I think like it's hard when you have OCD, at least for me, because I want to be likable and I want to be, you know, a patient that doesn't cause a lot of bother. And even like the idea like, oh, am I making up this this chronic illness because like I just want like attention or something like like I often have that thought. And I'm like, well, logically, no, because I've been diagnosed with this for my whole life. Uh, But the thoughts still there. And I guess the other thing I wanted to add was just that. um I know for me growing up, I didn't because I didn't know I had OCD and I really wanted to compensate for being what I considered like having a deficit of being like disabled. And I thought, well, thought, well, if I miss so much school and I and I miss so many like social activities because I'm sick or in the hospital, like I have to make up for it. I have to be like the best friend, the best student, the best athlete, whatever. Um, and I didn't realize like that's OCD too, because like that perfectionism is just really like insidious and it gets in every aspect of your life. When in in fact, now I know as an adult, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know this my whole adulthood, but really like learning about disability studies and, you know, like sort of the inherent right of everyone to have a nice life, regardless of ability and lots of different factors. Um, You know, I didn't realize that like, just because you're human, that sort of common humanity from, um, you know, self-compassion, mindfulness practice, like, is really important to me because, like, 
yeah, it's it's so I I find it easier to be nice to other people than to myself. And so just sort of reminding myself like, yeah, just because you have like X and Y going on or OCD or whatever doesn't mean you have any less, you know, right to a nice life and to make it as meaningful to you as possible, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. And I guess a question for both of you then is um just piggybacking on what you just said, Sandy, kind of about self-compassion. Obviously important for, for people with OCD, but also I imagine with chronic illness alongside it, 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 it can probably be even easier to beat oneself up and be hard on yourself. So do you guys sort of think about self-compassion or try and go easy on yourself? Or is there anything you do when times are hard to soften it, I guess? I think the big thing for me is just like reminding myself that you know, I am as worthy of like my own love and compassion as all my, you know, all the people I meet on the street or my friends or my family. And I think like mm. just sort of remembering that in this society that really values productivity a lot of the time above other things, it's okay that you aren't the most productive or the best at everything you do, especially like the first time when you're trying something new. Um, because like your worth as a human is is like sort of innate I guess like it's just part of you as a human it's not about what you do and how you do it like of course it's nice to be uh feel confident of what you do and feel good about what you're doing but I guess at the end of the day I try to remind myself like my worth is in my humanity yeah yeah nice yeah I've actually I feel like I've learned a lot about self-compassion through becoming friends with Sandy because I think she you know that like this is gonna sound weird but you know the saying like what would jesus do mine is like what would sandy do here like because i think sandy's you know shown a lot of you know compassion towards others and she really has it like worked out for her like i don't know if sandy feels this way and i don't want to speak for you sandy but i feel like you like have learned what works for you and something that i've really struggled with is not being able to do what I could do in the past because the chronic illness has come so much later in my life. So I used to be an athlete and like play volleyball all the time and sports and can't really do that anymore. And for me, it's been really hard to like have my mom call doctors for me or my newest thing that I'm even embarrassed to say is like having someone come over to help me with laundry because Hmm. I'm on the fourth floor in my apartment now, which was like a really bad move and wouldn't have done it if I knew that was the case. Um, But I've had to like hire someone to help with that. And that's self-compassion is like doing something like that and hearing that like Sandy's had to do something like that in the past or like that, you know, other people with chronic illness go through that same kind of grief of you know what you could do before or like what you can do compared to others um has been really helpful for me in like giving myself that compassion yeah yeah thank you for sharing that um and i guess it'd be great to hear about your special interest group at the isdf and and i know you guys have an instagram page together right so just if you want to talk about that too yeah, so I think we started our special interest group officially. I think we had our first meeting in March 2023. Yeah. So maybe like a little under a year now, but it feels it feels like longer because I think we've really gathered together a nice group of people who are really committed to creating community and advocacy. And so the group is for anyone with uh, lived experience of chronic illness or disability and OCD, as well as clinicians who want to learn about the intersections of those conditions. And we have a couple meetings a month that we just sort of build community and talk about common themes and challenges for people living with those conditions. Then we also have a special uh, working group meeting every month where we try to work on specific advocacy program pro- projects to raise awareness of chronic illness and disability f- for the wider OCD community because lots of people have OCD but don't know what it's like to have chronic illness and disability. So yeah, what do you want to add, Jesse? Yeah, I would just add that we were able, you know, Sandy and I had this idea and the IOCDF was amazing with helping us, you know, make it happen. We didn't really know any clinicians like 
you're like, yeah, we have to find a clinician, but we don't really, you know, know someone. And um, we had someone like put out a thing on like a Facebook group and ended up getting a ton of people who were interested. And we found these two amazing clinicians who now run the SIG with us, uh, Mary and Jake, who both have lived experience and are clinicians, um, mm. lived experience with both, which has been so insightful and so cool. And what's been really interesting, too, is that we all have very different conditions. Like we have someone who is blind and we have someone who has, you know, some GI issues sometimes to people who are like housebound, you know, like you have Mm. such a range of conditions and we all seem to have such similar experiences. Like we all have different OCD themes. We all have all these different things going on but we all are going through very similar challenges and experiences. Um, And I think we've really noticed, like, I remember, I don't know, my mom was like, how many people you really think are going to sign up for this? Like, this is very niche. Um, And we have like over 180 people on our list um, who are interested and who, you know, I, we don't have 180 attend every time, but you know, we have a lot of people who, um, this impacts. So it's been really cool for us, um, to meet others with similar experiences. And I've learned a lot from, um, different people in the group. That's awesome. And if people want to like sort of take part or, or help out, how would they do that? Yeah, we'd love that. Um, we have, um, I could give you the link and everything, but it's on the IOCDF website um, under special interest groups. Um, and then we have, as you had mentioned, Sandy and I have an Instagram page where we try to um, just raise some awareness about different topics. Um, and that's chronically underscore courageous, Sandy? Yeah. Chronically dot courageous. Chronically dot courageous. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a, clearly I'm very invested, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes to both those things uh, so people can just go there and click that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. It's really good. And I'm glad uh, it's it's hit the ground running and you've got so many people already. I'm sure hopefully a few more after this uh, will listen and want to want to be part of it. Um, so I'm guessing. Uh, to, to both of you, was there, I'm sure there's many, but was there a roadblock that sticks out for you in your recovery? And if so, how did you overcome it or are overcoming it? Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I think the biggest roadblock was really uh, entrenched and persistent depression. I mean, mm. it's really hard to do an ERP and fight um I guess fight for your life when, you know, you don't want to get out of bed or you don't want to brush your teeth. And even those little things feel like so hard and everything feels so hopeless. Mm. Uh, But the biggest way I think I have really gotten into sort of a, a recovery lifestyle is by realizing that OCD is sort of a lifelong condition. You know, you might not always meet clinical criteria for OCD, but you always have to be using your tools and sort of be proactive. And the other thing that was really big for me was uh, community support. So I attend a local uh, goal group and that's sort of a a structured support group for people with OCD. And I, I made like some really good friends through that. And we really keep each other accountable and say like, you know, have you been doing your ERP lately? And how's that going? And you know, how is that stressor in your life? And, and we're just also friends. So we have like the, the mix of accountability and like, we care about each other. And I think, Mm. I guess that's group support, I think is probably the biggest thing that's really helped because when you're in a group, you sort of have that like positive pressure to try to succeed and do your best. And so if anyone's really struggling, you know, I would really, really recommend, or at least it worked for me, like trying to find some group support um because when you share experiences and you can share knowledge and share tools i think that's really powerful yeah i totally agree with that i think my biggest roadblock came when i moved away for college i was like such a homebody that i think i shocked everyone by deciding to move across the country um for college Um, And it wasn't that I wanted to get away or anything. I just loved the university I I chose. Um, And 
it kind of my OCD like flared up a lot at that point. Um, mm-hmm. And it actually, interestingly enough, got a lot better with my like most persistent theme of like the intrusion and the door locking because I was in a completely different setting where like there were more people around me to like fend off the intruders um but I really struggled one of my longest other um obsessions and compulsions has been around um perfectionism like with grades and I was at a place that very much like emphasized like everyone really cared about doing well with grades and um I kind of got really deep into that, had my first um, like roommate where I was like literally living with another person who was kind of mean. So it was like not the best situation. And I realize now a lot of my OCD attached on to that living situation as well. Um, So that was a huge challenge for me. And then not being able to, I had been working with that therapist so long And then I moved across the country. So I had to find someone else. And um, that was a very challenging experience for me as well. And that's when I was recommended to um, find online groups, which, you know, completely changed my life now. So I totally echo everything that Sandy said um, in regard to that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's been great to hear how you you both have been positively impacted by joining a support group. yeah, I was talking to to a client today about support groups and and they never want to go, you know. Clients, I was so right? resistant too. I don't know why, yeah. but I was like, no way. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think mean, is it. You just think everyone there is going to be completely weird, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. Or it sometimes I guess it's hard. I don't want to share. I don't want to open up. Maybe that's also a part of it, right? I think totally. Also- it can be a really vulnerable experience when you go to a support group, but like it's a really brave step. Like just going to your first support group, like wow, that takes courage. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. I agree, especially on Zoom when you're like waiting <laughs> and it's like host will let you in soon. And like you have like the highest like anxiety spike of your life just waiting for a host to let you in. And you don't know if it's gonna be like you and one other person or like a huge room yeah. of people. Yeah. They just keep you waiting ages as an exposure. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they don't do that. Um, uh, yeah. No, but I'm, I'm glad you guys have been able to share a really positive side of support groups. It's been awesome. Um, so I guess just to both of you, uh, words of hope for anyone with OCD and or OCD in chronic illness. You go first, Jesse. Okay. <laughs> I would say the hope is like just that it it really does get so much better. I mean, even recently I I've, you know, been in OCD treatment for so long and then had one of my like 10 out of 10, like, you know, when they say like that's not gonna happen and then it like happens. I've been like terrified of uh, I feel my suds rising saying this, but I've been terrified of like mice or rats or anything like coming into my space and I moved to Boston in an apartment which I like never connected that like that could actually happen you know who knows if I would have made different life decisions (laughs) if I knew that Um, but I had a mouse in my apartment flipped um, and that was kind of thrown back into like torturous intrusive images and thoughts and like you know living at a high suds level daily um even now I'm like back in my apartment after a short stint at the hotel um and so it's you know it's it's tough being like thrown back in it but I'm reminded even more so how ERP helps and ERP works and that it never feels easy just like joining the support groups like you said is like so challenging but then it becomes so rewarding and it is so worth it Mm, nice and i think for me the biggest thing i would say as words of hope really is that even in the darkest of times you know even if you're really sick there is hope and you know you deserve recovery whether that's ocd recovery or you know even if your chronic illness or disability maybe isn't going away it's okay to grieve but know that you're not alone and 
there's lots of people out there going through similar situations who understand what you're going through. And I guess like that you have value, even if you're sick, even if you're struggling and you deserve a wonderful, meaningful life. And you can get that even with chronic illness or disability or OCD. Yeah. Brilliant. Good words. Thank you. Um, so you've both got a billboard where you live. What do you want written on that billboard? Okay, I thought about this because I've listened to your podcast and I still am struggling to come up with the answer, which is totally perfectionism showing its way. But if I if I had the billboard, I feel like I would want it to say like one of those really like taboo intrusive thoughts and then have it say like this is ocd so like people Mm. see that like you know a way of saying like ocd is not an adjective but like a concrete example Mm. um so people because we all know a lot of those thoughts would make people like stop and be like whoa did you see that billboard um so i think that'd be cool yeah agreed oh i love that i think my billboard would say something like And I don't know, I haven't really workshopped this yet. So, um, but I think I would say something like, you know, mental health care is just as important as physical health care. And everyone deserves access to, you know, the health care they need. I know that's a lot of words for a billboard. um, (laughs) But I guess like, I just want to something, something to say something like to end the dichotomy between like mental health care and and physical health care like being separate because they're they're all like mm. part of health. So I don't know. Yeah. I have to workshop that more. No, I like it though. I agree. It's all coming from the same body, right? Um yeah. mental health and physical health. So um uh, and then you could both uh pick up the phone and call the 20 year old you. What do you tell her? I would tell myself that you're not making this up Um, because that has been my biggest struggle with my chronic illness and OCD is that I not only struggle with the OCD, then struggle with the chronic illness, but then I add more suffering to it by, um, by kind of believing that and like falling into the traps of OCD and just kind of like cutting it off. I remember in the SIG, someone had mentioned like, someone was struggling and another person was like, no, like this is real. And I was like, whoa, you're right. (laughs) Like, and so um, I think that would have gone a long way for me first going through all of those challenges. Yeah. So I think if I could call my 20 year old self, the first thing I would say is, uh, Sandy, you have OCD and you need to find a specialist (laughs) who treats OCD. So I could save myself a little bit of time with treatment. But I'd also say, I think in a bigger sense, like, you know, life has some hard times in it and and you're going to make it through those tough times. But here's the bad news. No one is coming to save you. But the good part of that is that you're going to save yourself with the help of people who care for you and who love you. And you're going to have a really meaningful and wonderful life. So there's so much hope. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I like it. And then lastly, to both of you, is there anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? The only thing I would say is that I know something that's not talked about a lot is the um, fact that um, chronic illness really impacts how therapists can do ERP with clients. Um, I get why it's not talked about a lot, because if I didn't go through chronic illness, I would have no idea and also would not really quite see the importance or like need for there to be a change. Um, But I think something that we're really trying to do is show um, different therapists and like really try to help educate therapists that. Sometimes things have to be switched up a little bit ERP wise um, when it comes to patients who are chronically ill, um, because sometimes, you know, the great thing about ERP is that it's go, go, go. And like, let's, you know, put it all in and let's use our energy and like, let's do this. Like, let's fight OCD. And I think that's why I got better from OCD. But that's also sometimes not possible 
when you're exhausted or you're in the hospital or, or you're super sick. Um, and so we really invite like therapists or mental health professionals or even doctors, you know, to learn more about um, how chronic illness can impact treatment, whether it is ERP, whether it's, you know, CBT or anything like that. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, absolutely. And Sandy, I guess I just, yeah, that, um, you know, we really welcome people to come check out the SIG and, you know, see if it's a good fit for them. And I guess like, thank you to the IOCDF because like, none of this would be possible without them. And they were really welcoming and encouraging. And yeah, I'm just so thankful that we have this group of people who want to work for increased OCD care. And like, I think that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Dead yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really good point. And yeah, to everyone listening, I'll, I'll link in the show notes to the special interest group and obviously your Instagram well, uh, thank you so much both for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.